Why do Canadians go ballistic in war? Ah, Canadians, we all know the stereotype. Nice, friendly, and extremely apologetic. If you're fighting them, though, avoid them at all costs, because for some strange reason, these usually calm maple leaf lovers go absolutely ballistic when there's a war on. Trench raids. In World War I, the only thing scarier than going on a trench raid was to be on the receiving end of a Canadian one. Soon after their deployment, the Canucks earned a fearsome reputation as enthusiastic and innovative practitioners of this brutal art. To maximize stealth, they were known to blacken their faces and to wear thick rubber gloves. They also brought along with them a variety of handmade weapons to optimize their killing effectiveness, such as spiked clubs, knives, and brass knuckles to allow them to take out enemies silently. Alternatively, pipe bombs and grenade catapults were used if they preferred to go in guns blazing. On operation, the Canadians tore through trenches so quickly and with such cold-blooded efficiency that by the end of the war, they were able to reach up to one kilometer behind enemy lines. Their speed and ferocity earned them the nicknames from the terrified Germans ranging from stormtroopers to wild colonials. The savage determination of the Canadians was most on show in the four months leading up to the Battle of Vimy Ridge, when they conducted 55 raids. The most disastrous of these happened in March of 1917, involving over 1,300 soldiers, despite suffering an appalling 43% casualty rate and being constantly gassed, one group of raiders was able to clear a 450-meter section of the German trench. Killing prisoners of war. When they weren't going on deadly nighttime raids, the Canadians could usually be found slaughtering prisoners of war. Shockingly, in World War I, the murder of German POWs was actively encouraged by some commanders. Before the attack on Vimy Ridge, for instance, one soldier recalled how an officer told him, Remember, no prisoners. They'll just eat your rations. Having to share already limited food supplies was just one of the reasons why most preferred to shoot rather than capture. But the most powerful justifications were revenge and battle rage. In a typical account, one lieutenant would recall how, after losing half of his company to machine gun fire, his surviving men rushed to the battery that had caused the damage to find the Germans inside crying and with their hands up. Unmoved, they proceeded to mercilessly bludgeon and shoot them to death. Another would relate on one occasion, a German rushed to one of his comrades with a bayonet, but then chickened out and surrendered. In his own words, our boy would have none of it. He lunged at the German again and again, who each time lowered his arms and stopped the point of the bayonet with his bare hands. The German was screaming for mercy. Even if a surrendering German somehow survived his initial encounter with a wild colonial, his life was still in great danger. In this regard, one veteran would remember how he once witnessed one of his fellow Canadians turn a German POW into red mist by dropping a live grenade into his greatcoat pocket. Live and let die. During World War I, soldiers carried out an unofficial live and let live policy. This was an unspoken agreement in which both sides agreed to only attack each other if ordered. The most famous example of this inaction was the unofficial 1914 Christmas Day Truce, in which thousands of combatants from both sides exchanged gifts, sang carols, and mingled with each other for a few hours. The next year, though, the Canucks were on the front lines, and unlike their allies, Live and Let Live was not in their vocabulary. Among their number were the troops of the 3rd Battalion, who were stationed in the Ypres salient on the Western Front. In the spirit of the previous year, voices from the opposing trench wished them a happy Christmas, and some of the friendlier Canucks returned the greetings. After a couple of minutes, men from both sides had raised their heads above the dugouts, and an older, whiskered man was invitingly waving a box of cigars. Moments later, a Canadian sergeant ruined Christmas by dispatching two Germans with his machine gun. Of course, this wouldn't be the last time the Germans of the Great War were tricked into a false sense of security by their heartless North American foe. In one particularly cruel episode, Canuck troops tossed tins of corned beef into a German trench. 
Then, when they heard their requests for more, they lobbed grenades at them instead. As the stories so far have illustrated, for some reason, Canadians went absolutely bananas in World War I. But why were they so angry? Some historians have argued their ruthlessness was an emotional response to a battlefield rumor about the so-called Crucified Canadian, an officer who was supposedly crucified to a barn door near Ypres. Others have speculated their thirst for revenge drew from their traumatic experience at the harrowing 1915 Second Battle of Ypres, during which Canadians took the brunt of the first-ever German poison gas attack of the war. The best explanation, however, may be the simple fact that Canadians were brutalized more than any others because they were always being placed in the first wave of attacks. Juno Beach By the close of the Great War, the Canadians had gone from a relatively unknown fighting force to one of the planet's most feared and respected military outfits. It was with this hard-earned reputation that they would enter the killing fields of World War II to face off against a German army reinforced by elite units with a strangely familiar name, Stormtroopers. On June 6, 1944, the Canadians reminded everyone of their elite status when they pulled off what's considered one of the most tactically successful operations of D-Day. Their objective was to storm Juno Beach and then seize the cities of Caen and Bayou with 14,000 soldiers and 1,000 paratroopers. During the first wave, 3,000 lion-hearted Canadians rushed towards German pillboxes, taking heavy casualties. They were then followed in by tanks, which obliterated most of the German beach defenses, allowing infantrymen to swarm in and begin close quarters fighting. Impressively, it took them less than two hours to secure their first route off the beach at the small town of Courcelles. By the end of the day, Courcelles-sur-Mer, saint aubin sur mer and coulombier sur soleil had all fallen, and the tank regiment of the 1st Hussars were at the Cannes-Bayou highway intersection, making them the only Allied unit on D-Day to actually reach their final objective. The Devil's Brigade in World War II, the Canadians distinguished themselves not only as dependable infantrymen, but also as skilled commandos in a joint American-Canadian unit called the First Special Service Force, better known as the Devil's Brigade or the Black Devils. The Devil's Brigade was formed in June 1942 and had only accepted individuals into its ranks who were already well acquainted with survival and the outdoors. As a result, former skiers, parachutists, hunters, lumberjacks, trappers, and game wardens made up the majority of its personnel. These hard and rugged men were transformed into killing machines via a brutal training regime that involved a hundred mile speed marches and specialist training with all sorts of weapons, explosives, and vehicles. To strike fear into their enemies' hearts on the battlefield, they placed a calling card on the dead, emblazoned with the phrase, the worst is yet to come in German. The Black Devils were assigned the most dangerous assignments, with one of their most iconic missions taking place in December of 1943 at the mountain peak of Monte la Defensa, southeast of Rome. For about a month, multiple British, Canadian, and American assaults attempting to dislodge the Germans at the top had been wiped out one after the other. By the time the Devil's Brigade arrived on the scene, Monte la Defensa had been battered with over 200,000 shells, earning it the nickname, the Million Dollar Hill. At 1.30 a.m. on December 3rd, carrying 60-pound rucksacks as well as knives, guns, and bayonets, and with charcoal blackened faces, 600 men of the 1st Special Service Force began climbing up the near-vertical cliff face as fog and swirling snow enveloped the mountain. A little before 6 a.m., they reached the summit and began quietly slitting the throats of sentries. Then, all of a sudden, a rock slide gave away their position and the enemy opened fire. The fighting was intense and both sides suffered heavy losses, but the battle-hardened Germans were eventually expelled. In a mere two hours, the month-long standoff had been ended by a force that was ten times smaller than the combined Allied force that had up until then failed to take Monte la Defensa. With a little help from the Americans, they had shown that once again, that to mess with a Canadian in wartime is to sign your own death warrant. <laughs>